is the title for today's teaching is God's Protection from Division, a.k.a. deacons. Bet you never thought of it that way. And we're going to, I mean, the deacons that we have here, um, I want you to think about what we're about to learn. You're, the purpose of creating a group of men to do what you do is to keep the church from attacking each other and free up the teachers and pastors to pastor instead of keep spreadsheets. Um, both are needed, but that is God's protection from division, deacons. So Lord, bless this word as we begin and help us to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his will for us. Amen. Okay, I'm going to go a little quick review. The church has been growing. These people who were sneaking up to the stage are coming to get notes. If you don't have them, you can grab some notes. All the cross-references today, well, 90% of the cross-references are on there. Um, the church has been growing. In Acts 1, the church is growing. How many were there? Let's see if, let's see if you guys can do it. Without looking at your notes, how many were there in Acts 1? It gives us a number. Do you remember? In the upper room, there were about 120. It says literally in Acts 1, the number of the names of the disciples was about 120. In Acts 2, Pentecost happens. How many? 3,000. Now there's 3,120, right? And in Acts 4, it says those who heard the word believed and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And then in Acts 4.32, it says the multitude of those who believed. So this thing is mushrooming. This work of God is mushrooming. Again, also one of the reasons you see everybody selling their stuff and feeding each other, that is not a standard practice inside the church. That was a very specific event that was occurring because thousands and thousands of visitors were getting saved and they did not have houses and they did not have jobs and they weren't leaving each other because they were all born again and they were filled with the spirit and they were following God. And even later on, churches send money to Jerusalem to take care of the church down there. In Acts 5, it says the believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And we ended last week with the apostles being beaten and yet it says, in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus. Whenever God is doing a great work, so is the enemy. Jesus, the Son of God, was baptized. The Spirit of God came on him. And the very next thing that occurred was a satanic temptation and a powerful one. Do not think that just because you are thriving in ministry somehow, that means you have zero to worry about from the enemy. It is exactly the opposite, okay? Paul even says in, about the church of Ephesus, a great and open effective door has been laid before me and it's open and the adversaries are many. He saw them both as the same thing, a great door and adversaries. When God has given you a great door in ministry, expect adversaries. Do not gripe about it. Do not whine about it. Be prepared for it. It is a war. Ephesians says we are in a war. Okay, so first, the enemy will start generally through persecution. Generally. In Acts 4, it says they laid hands on Peter and John and put them in custody. That doesn't sound so bad. Maybe a house arrest. And then it says they threatened them and let them go. So it started off with a, you know, grab them. Let's just hold them for a little while and then threaten them and let them go. And Acts 5, it says the high priest rose up and all those who were with him filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles. So now there's 12 of them and put them in the common prison. It's elevated a little bit bigger from house arrest, if you will, to, as I said last week, the drunk tank. And they held them. It even says they wanted to kill them. And this time, after they were talked off the ledge by Gamaliel, don't kill him, you might be fighting God, it says they had them beaten and commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. So now they have been, you could see as the multitudes are growing, the persecution is increasing. That's normal. That's normal Christianity. But when that was going on, there was a second attack. It's Acts chapter 5. What was the second attack? Corruption from within. 
persecution from without and corruption from within. You cannot read the New Testament without finding out that there are many people inside the church who are actually against the church and against Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus told the disciples? In Luke 12, 1, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The word leaven is yeast, and yeast is a corruption. It's always a corruption. That's why we like the bread. We like the little corrupt bread, right? It puffs up, right? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And what is the leaven of the Pharisees according to Luke 12? You know it. What is it? He says, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. It gets in and it grows inside the church. And pretty soon we're all a bunch of religious hypocrites. It happens. It creeps in like leaven. And so corruption can happen. And how did that happen? In Acts 5, as multitudes are being added to the church and people are being super generous, Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds, which would have been okay. But then they decided to, quote, lie to God. And why did they lie to God? Uh, Acts 5, 3 says, because Satan filled their heart. It's Satan. What happened? Ananias, this whole event was satanic. Satanic. He not only tried to beat them and tried to harm them from the outside, he tries to corrupt them from the inside. It's a satanic thing. Jesus called Judas a, a son of perdition. Satan filled Judas's heart from the inside. He didn't go to the outside. It was from the inside corruption. And so they claim that they had sold this house for less and they give that to the Lord. And it says the two of them breathed their last. Exact words in Acts 5.5 5 and Acts 5.10 because God is not deceived. So when God is doing something wonderful, you should expect spiritual resistance. First persecution and then corruption and then division. Believers, saved people on this side and saved people on that side. We're not talking about heretics or false teachers. We're talking about believers who love Jesus and now don't love each other. That is also satanic. And we're going to cover that today. So according to our God's word, quote, our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Interesting word, devour, because later on, we are warned if he doesn't devour us in Galatians 5, he will stir you up to devour and bite one another. If the devil can't stop you, he'll get a fellow Christian to do it through division. Here we go. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying... Here it is. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. In the New Testament, you will read about a widow's list. This is somebody who doesn't have a family to care for them, doesn't have the ability to work, and needs help, and the church is supposed to help them. And so there was a, a distribution to the needy, if you will. A widow was someone who was needy. Notice the widows don't complain. That jumped out to me right away. It's not the widows complaining. It's two different groups of Christians complaining against each other. So you read Acts chapter 5, literally the apostles are doctoring their backs from all the wounds from the beatings they just took while the complainers run in the front to gripe about how Johnny took away from Susie. I want to tell you, you can ask an elder, that is probably one of the most discouraging things that you can have happen to you. You're literally suffering for Jesus and the whiners are whining. And it is hard to handle. And it is hard to be gracious. Can you wait long enough so they could stitch my back up before we complain about whether you got a whole loaf and a half or only a loaf and a quarter? It's really hard. I'm sharing the truth. It's really hard. In one sentence, Acts 6-1, the church is literally divided in half. Hellenists and Hebrews. Now, probably you don't know what a Hellenist and a Hebrew is. But the Hebrews, now realize the church is all Jews. So there's the Hebrew Jews and the Hellenist Jews, but they're all followers of Christ. The Hebrew Jews were the ones who lived in Judea. They're the locals, right? 
They lived near Jerusalem. They went to the temple lots of times in their life and worshiped the Lord. They had the authentic Hebrew language. The Hellenists were not them. The Hebrews prided that they had always been in the Father's land, in their Father's land. The Jews, however, who had been dispersed through the Assyrian occupation, through the Babylonian occupation, and were dispersed everywhere, they were still Jews. I mean, was Mordecai not a Jew? Right, but he was a Hellenist. He didn't live in Israel next to the temple, right? He lived in the capital of the pagan empire. Those Jews had learned Greek. That was the most common language. They were living among the Greeks, and so they speak Greek. In fact, those Jews are the ones who read the Septuagint, the Greek translation. The other Jews, they read the Hebrew in its purity, right? The Jews who were dispersed among the Greeks were considered outsiders. It's kind of like when you try and move into Camas Valley and 30 years later, you're the new person. <laughs> right? So the, the, the Hellenists were worldly. They were the worldly Jews. Not necessarily, but their culture was different. It was not pure he Hebrew Judaism. And so these two groups already had tension. What translation do you read? Huh? <laughs> you don't read King James? Oh my goodness. Oh my... On my social media, I'm just telling you, I cannot believe how many, I hope this isn't mocking, I'm going to say it, stupid comments I get about, you should read it from the King James. I'm like, well, you should share whatever it says from the King James. I, I don't, yeah, King James is great. But there's people who want to divide over these things. And, and you know what? Jews have a tendency to be prejudiced. I bet you didn't know that. It's true. They really do. In fact, in John 4, when Jesus is sharing with the woman at the well, she says these words. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That was the, that's the culture that they're in. The separation. Well, you're not a Jew, right? You're from, you're from I don't know, Cyprus. You're not local, right? This really has little to do with bread. I, it, really, it has to do with two different groups and ultimately, and I actually have this in my notes, it says, write this down. Selfish division is satanic opposition. Selfish division is satanic opposition. Division in the body is so dangerous. God's word literally says these words in Proverbs 6. I hate seven things. I'm quoting God. I hate seven things. Pride. Liars, hands that shed innocent blood, hearts that plan wicked things, feet that are quick to do evil, liars again, no joke, it makes it, liars makes it twice in that list, liars again, and the last one, number seven, a person who sows discord among brethren. I hate that, God says. You can quote God, I hate people who cause division. Wow. Wow. Pretty serious, serious enough that in the New Testament, we are told to do three things. Number one, identify those doing it. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. We're to, note, we're to know, oh, that's a divisive person. We're to identify them. You are to look around and you're to go, oh, that person is a divider. And number two, avoid them if you can. I urge you, brethren, I'm quoting Romans 16, 17. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Don't hang out with the divisive person. Don't do it. And finally, if they will not stop being divisive, you reject them. It says that in Titus 3.10. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. You go to him and say, hey, you're being divisive. Stop that. Hey, you're being divisive. Stop that. Finally, you say, I got nothing to do with you. You separate from a divisive person because God hates division. It's also behind Ephesians 4, when God commands us to walk in lowliness and gentleness with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, and then this word, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring, the word is working really hard. It is not easy to stay united with people who are not you. Every marriage knows this. And you love that spouse. 
still not easy to walk united. You have to endeavor to walk united. And in Romans, it says, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So you make every effort. You work hard. That is your number one. Hold this together. Don't take wrongs. Be long-suffering, gentle, humble. Because the devil is the only winner when believers attack each other. But this is not uncommon. It's been around for a while. This happened in the early Corinthian church. Listen to this. So believers started, they just started, I'm not going to forgive you. In fact, you've wronged me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get what's due. The what about me is not a quote from the Bible. What about me? Well, I don't know. You're not in the Bible. What about others? That's a quote from the Bible. What about me? Jesus literally said, if they slap you on your face, turn your face away and let them slap the other one. Now, we don't want to do that, even as believers. And so in the Corinthian church, they began taking each other to court. And Paul has a lot to say about it. Listen to his words. So here's believers who are just trying to get what's fair and just. Listen to these words in 1 Corinthians 6. Brother goes to law against brother? And that before unbelievers? My Bible has an exclamation point. He's worked up. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you. When brother takes brother to court before non-believing magistrates, you have already failed. That's what Paul says. It's already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another and then he says, here's what you do. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? He said it would be better to be cheated by a brother than to take a brother to court. Wow. That, oh, who, I'm sure everyone's like, oh, that's, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. We're in a Sue happy culture right now. Paul did have a fix, though. Here's his fix. You ready? Why don't you call for a wise man among the believers who will be able to judge between his brethren? Why don't you resolve this with a third party who's also a believer and just, but you have to, it's hard. I've been involved in some of these. It's really hard because the believers have to be truly followers of Christ because whatever the third party decides, that's it. And most people are, would rather go to court and maybe win. It's already an utter failure. How are they going to handle this division? They're going to select seven wise men to do exactly what Paul said, to deal with this and hear your complaints and make just causes. It's exactly what Moses and the 70 elders did. It's biblical. So in verse two, then the 12 who are wounded summoned the multitude of the disciples, calls everybody, all of you, Hellenists, Hebrews, and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wow, that's insulting, right? No, it isn't. Do you get saved by them serving tables? The Bible hadn't been written. The only ones who knew what Jesus said were those he taught. Everybody wanted to know what Jesus said and how to live. Sorry, I can't. I got to bake bread. Now, baking bread is good and useful and right, but there are divisions in the body. That's a wrong word. There are different ministries in the body. These men had literally been told by Jesus, make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Should they stop now and create a bread spreadsheet? Is that what they're that, that they should be doing? Sorry, I cannot teach a Bible study. I got to keep track of the bread records. Is that the right thing to do? The apostles recognize what is happening. They realize that this could be a distraction from what God has called them to do and a division. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, you're always going to have divisions. Right now, there are people probably in division, if not with me, with each other. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. The divisions are there to prove who really is following Jesus Christ and who is not. That's what he said. So you can't let division become a distraction. 
when you are doing a great work for God and division happens around you, you can't let division become a distraction where you waste your time engaging with every single complaint because complainers never go away. But you can't let division become destruction either. It can't be a distraction. It can't be destruction. So what do you do? You get a godly person to help you. And the office of deacon is created to form and protect the church from this division and this distraction. D.L. Moody once said, it's better to set 10 men to work than to do the work of 10 men. Amen. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. They're looking at this mass of people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. Interesting. You guys figure out who you trust and then we will exercise authority over them for you. It's all structure. And by the way, look what they call it. They, call it. they don't call it ministry. They call it business. Business. This thing needs to be done. It's business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Someone else needs to be appointed over this business so the apostles are free to pray and preach. Now, it's interesting. In Acts 6, they call it the deacons, but nobody calls them a deacon. There's no deacon here. The word, however, that's translated serve tables in verse 2 is literally diakonane or diakonos or deacon. Where it means to serve, servers. But this new role was so essential to the church that they became known as church leadership. Paul, in his letters, literally said to all the saints in Philippians 1 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops, that's an elder, and the deacons. They were so essential for the protection of the ministry of God in the church that the deacons are leadership, different leadership, protecting from division, protecting from distraction, but still part of leadership. And not only that, Paul qualifies them. And if you read it, they sound like an elder. In 1 Timothy 3, I'm going to read you the qualifications of these people because they have to make decisions. They have to sit between two people who are fighting and arguing about bread and figure out, you know, what's the wisdom of God? What's the right thing to do? They have to be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, real believers. But let these also first be tested. In other words, check them out. Then let them serve as deacon or literally deacon as deacons, being found blameless. And then it talks about their wives. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers. You know why? Because their wives are going to run across information that they could hurt people with. It's true for an elder's wife and for a deacon's wife. Your family will, by accident, hear things that if they are not closed mouth, can hurt a lot of people. I've seen a lot of churches ruined by their spouses. I have. Their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, not drinkers, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, so nobody, no multiple wives, ruling their children in their own house as well. They man, they're good at managing their house. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Stephen becomes the first martyr because he is so bold in his preaching, they have to kill him doesn't mean they're silent about the gospel. The gospel should be proclaimed in every way. But they have a specific ministry. Now, the Bible actually says these words. We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you, literally work until exhaustion, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. We urge you to recognize those who are laboring among you. I want the deacons to stand up. I want to recognize who they are. And there they are. We have four deacons. Don, Jay, that guy, Aaron, and Tim, and their families. And they take care of things for the elders. 
to keep division from happening. They can give counsel. They minister. They are a protection for this church. Lord, we ask you to bless these men and their wives who labor as much as they do. And ask in Jesus' name that you will give them wisdom in the days ahead. That you will help them, Lord, to make the decisions that you want for this body and, Lord, for the believers. And that you would bring the blessing, bold preaching, it says, a good standing before the Lord. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor. Notice anything about these names? They're all Greek, not one Hebrew name among them. Who was complaining? Oh, I love to do that. We need to do something about this in the church. Perfect, you've been hired. <laughs> oh my goodness. How many of you know I've done that to you? Raise your hand if I've done that to you and there's someone like, oh, you gotta do this or this, you know? Look around. I mean, you guys are not, this is a lot more. And if not, you need to come see me. I did it to you this morning. That's right. Yeah, oh, you need to do this and this. Well, you do it then. Here it is, a bunch of Greeks. Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte, not even a Jew. He's not even a Jew. He's a proselyte. He's a Gentile who became a Jew. He's not even born of the seed of Abraham. Oh, he'll be perfect. Let them Greeks gripe now from Antioch. One of the roles I wrote down of leadership in the body, we don't always like it, but we need it, is the ability to make a decision. Oh, yeah. If you're the person who can't make a decision, please do not lead. Please do not lead. A decision had to be made, right? God's word says in Judges 5.2, when leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Two things that are needed, a leader to lead and followers to follow. Bless the Lord, right? So you, one of the things that a leader needs to be able to do is make a decision, right? Romans 12 literally says these words in this list in Romans 12 of all the various giftings in the body. And these aren't the like miraculous giftings. These are sort of administrative giftings. Well, some of them are miraculous. But there's a list on how to use them. Here's the list. If you've been given the gift of prophecy, prophesy. In other words, if that's your gift, don't keep it. If it's in proportion to your faith. Or ministry, which by the word is deaconing. If you've been given the ministry of deaconing, let us use it in our deaconing. In other words, do what you were called to do. He who teaches, what do you think he's supposed to do? Teach, right? He who exhorts, what do you think he's supposed to do? Exhort. And he who leads. Literally, it says, he who leads with diligence, or literally, en spude. He who leads, get up there now. That's literally haste. The word there is haste. Get up there. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so leaders, lead, right? Make decisions. You're all complaining. You're all a bunch of Greeks, right? Well, we'll just, you know what? The 12 of us decided, you guys, will, it'll be all Greek deacons. There you go. Make a decision. But they laid hands on them, it says. They laid hands on them, in verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Have you, haven't, I remember when I first got saved, I thought, why? What's with the laying on of hands? Magical. I mean, it's like a movie or something. Oh, it's a force. I don't know. Why do we lay hands on them? There's laying on of hands all the way through the Bible. Here is what it is, this, in the simplest terms. It's literally making a connection between the giver and the receiver. When you're laying hands on an animal for sacrifice, you're making a connection. My sins, this animal, and the animal dies. When you're laying hands on a believer, literally, I, actually Hebrews 6 says that there's a list of these things that are elementary principles of our faith. One of them is laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Jesus laid hands on children. Matthew 19, 15. Why? What was he doing? What did I just tell you? He was making a connection between him and the children. 
The Samaritans received the Holy Spirit when Peter and John laid hands on them. They were believers, they were baptized, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit until two Jews put their hands on them. And then they received the Holy Spirit. What was happening there? They are full partners in this ministry and this church. We are all together in this. Saul received his eyesight when Ananias entered the house and laid hands on him. When they sent Paul, Saul and Barnabas out to be missionaries, it says they laid hands on them and they sent them away. Same thing we've done here when we send our people overseas. We lay hands on them. Why? We're going with them. We are connected. We are one. Timothy received a spiritual gift with the laying on of hands of the eldership. And so why are the elders laying on hands on the deacons? What's that about? They're connecting. They're literally saying, we are sharing our authority with them. Their decisions are our decisions. Our decisions are their decisions. We are one. Which is also why Paul told Timothy, when you appoint leaders, man, hear this if you are involved in any church ministry. When you appoint leaders, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Well, I get that don't share in their sin, but when I lay hands on someone who is sinful and they are making decisions and in leadership, I am sharing in their sin. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. And then he goes on to say, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. In other words, don't be quick. Really make sure there's not some sin tra trailing along behind them. Um, likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Give it time, and you'll know whether a person is godly or not. You can. But don't be in a rush. Don't be in a rush. And so they lay hands on them, and they give them their authority. And look at verse 7. Then. I love that. We dealt with the division. The deacons are taking care of removing this division from the body. Then the word of God spread. Who knows Psalm 133? 133. Behold how beautiful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the oil on Aaron's beard and his robe, like the dew on Mount Hermon. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Commanded it. When there are peacemakers among us, specifically deacons, because someone needed help and they got upset because they didn't get help. And now the deacons will go help them if they can and if it's appropriate. And there's this protection for the body from division. When that happens, the word of God spreads. The blessing of the Lord is there. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Because the bread issue had been taken away. They'd taken that weapon from the enemy. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. These seven men, in Acts 21.8, they get, they get their own title. They're called literally the seven. Philip was one of the seven, it says. And two of these seven are in church history. Stephen, who preaches so boldly, he becomes the very first martyr in the New Testament. And Philip, who really actually became the first missionary. He was the one who went up to Samaria and so they were getting saved in Samaria. And then he was the one who went down to the desert towards Africa and met the Ethiopian and led him to Jesus. And then he gets whisked off to Caesarea where he has a very spirit-filled family, according to Acts 21.9. His daughters were all prophesying. And I thought about that for a second. It says in Acts 21.9, his daughters, his four virgin daughters were prophets, prophetesses. Would you like that? Would you like your teenage daughter to be full of the Holy Spirit and speak into your life prophetically? <laughs> Yeah, he was something special. But each of these seven, even though five sort of disappeared to history, each of these seven could claim Acts 6, 7 as their life verse. Deacons, Acts 6, 7 is what happens when you do the ministry that you've been called to. Then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied. They kept the church from being derailed by administrative needs and by division. They allowed the apostles to meet and pray. To focus on the teaching God's word. And the results 
even the priests got saved. So that is actually my teaching for today. So no need to leave, Jarrett. They actually have jail ministry. They have to leave because they have jail ministry. But it's, it's really easy in a church body to fall prey to division. We, we can suffer when persecution happens. We get together and we hold each other, right? When corruption happens, that's a little bit harder when there's hypocrisy. Then pretty soon it's hard to tell who's, who's the weed and who's the wheat, right? But the hardest is division when believers who love Jesus turn on each other and bite and devour one another. Just like it says in Galatians. Blessed are the peacemakers. One of the ways that the division enters the church is through deacon work. Don't like the chairs, like the chairs, don't like the color, don't like the color, don't like the coffee, like the coffee, I don't like the length of service, I don't like the, the gravel driveway, I don't like the whatever, right? And these are all a distraction. We're here to pray, Amen. to worship, to share the gospel, to wait for the coming of the Lord, and to let one another be filled with courage from the other people. That's what we're here about. And if you don't like the chairs, I can go ahead and say, see the deacons. And I'm telling you, elders, isn't that nice? How many, how many elders have done that? You know what? You should talk to the deacons. Raise, elders, raise your hand if you have said that. When they, Tim, you never do, right? You always say you'll take care of it. Tim, Tim's half deacon, right? See the deacons. A church can become so focused, and many do, on buildings, food ministry, social outreach, humanitarian needs, all of which are good and loving and important, but that is not the focus of the church of Jesus Christ. It is not. We can't neglect the ministry of the word in order to meet the physical needs of the world. And deacons are our protection so that we can meet needs and not fall prey to division and distraction. That's the end. Lord, thank you for this word today. Bless your name. Bless our deacons. I pray, Lord, that we have a fuller grasp of what you are doing among us. And I just want to thank you. Thank you for deacons. And I want to thank you, Lord, that you again and again bring the elders back to Ministry of the word and prayer. Ministry of the word and prayer. I even feel it today, Lord, in my own heart. I got to make sure I'm focused on ministry of the word and prayer. Help us to do that. Be as faithful as the deacons are. Lord, we love you. We bless you. And we thank you that you have laid out the plans for a healthy church. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.